Hi, welcome back to First Year Undergraduate Microeconomics. In this presentation, we're going to introduce you to a sales tax. First, note that when buyers and sellers trade, they often have to pay a tax to the government. Now, in Australia, that's called the GST, or Goods and Services Tax. In Europe, it's called a VAT, or a Value Added Tax. They're basically the same thing. In the United States, they often have state sales taxes. Now, unlike Australia and Europe, where the shelf price includes a tax, when you go to the United States, you have a shelf price, might be, say, $10, but when you go up to the cash register, you might actually be paying, say, $11. The difference is simply, in this situation, the tax. And that's pretty much how a GST and a VAT also work, except in Australia or Europe, $11 would be the price on the shelf. What happens with the $1 difference between the $10 and the $11? Well, that $1 goes off to the government. That's the government's tax revenue. So from the buyer's perspective, they've paid $11. That's what's gone out of their pocket at the cash register. From the seller's perspective, they've only received $10. That's what they get to keep, with the government taking a dollar. In this presentation, we want to see the effect of a sales tax in our perfectly competitive market model. Our simple example has already captured the most important point. In every example we've looked at in previous presentations, we've assumed that the price paid by a buyer is the same as the price received by the seller. That was one of our assumptions in our perfectly competitive market model. When we've got a sales tax, we have to throw that assumption away because it is not true under a sales tax. In our little example that we had before, the price that the buyer paid was $11. The price the seller received was $10. The difference between the price the buyer pays and the price the seller receives was the $1 of tax that was taken by the government. So we're going to replace our assumption, our previous assumption that the price the buyer paid was the price the seller received. We're getting rid of that assumption and we're going to replace it with a new assumption. Our new assumption is that the price the buyer pays is equal to the price the seller receives plus the tax to the government. So when the buyer paid $11, that was divided between $1 to the government plus $10 as the price the seller receives. So we sometimes say that a tax on a good or a service puts a wedge or a gap between the price the buyer pays and the price the seller receives. To pick a concrete example, let's look at the market for pizza. We have the quantity of pizza down here on the horizontal axis. We have the price of pizza up here on the vertical axis. And let's suppose that initially we don't have any sales tax on pizza. We have our supply curve and our demand curve for pizza and our original equilibrium where the quantity that consumers would like to buy equals the quantity that producers would like to sell. That original equilibrium is given by P0 as the price and Q0 as the quantity traded. Now suppose that the government puts a sales tax on pizza. Let's suppose that it's T dollars on every pizza. Might be say $2.50. That's our tax on every pizza. Note that the price the buyers pay, which we'll call PB, must be exactly T dollars greater than the price the seller receives, which we'll call PS. Why? Well, the money's got to go somewhere. If there's a tax of, say, $2.50 on a pizza, and you go into a store as a buyer and you pay $17.50 for that pizza, well, $2.50, by the law, goes to the government. How much does the seller get to keep? Well, $17.50 that you paid as a buyer, minus the $2.50 to the government, the seller gets to keep $15. So in other words, the price the buyer pays is simply going to be T dollars more than the price the seller receives. 
But notice that trade is still voluntary. No one's going to force you to buy pizza. No one's going to force you to sell pizza. Which means that the quantity of pizza actually bought and the quantity of pizza actually sold must be the same thing. So what's our new equilibrium in the pizza market look like? I'm going to draw our new equilibrium on this diagram here. Now, we've got our supply and demand curves, and remember our original equilibrium price was P0 and our original equilibrium quantity was Q0. Remember that the tax puts a wedge between the price buyers pay and the price sellers receive. So, in terms of our diagram, the price that the buyer pays is going to have to be exactly T dollars more than the price the seller receives. T dollars is simply this gap between the buyer price and the seller price. It's that distance there in terms of dollars. So in our new equilibrium we know that the price the seller receives plus the tax must be equal to the price the buyer pays. But to have an equilibrium we have to be in the situation where there's only one quantity traded, that's voluntary trade, but for it to be in equilibrium, we have to have the situation where sellers' plans are what they can actually do, buyers' plans are what they can actually do, or in other words, the quantity that buyers want to buy at P1B, they can actually buy, the quantity that sellers want to sell at P1S is what they can actually sell, and there is only one quantity, because trade is voluntary. So, in equilibrium, the gap between P1B and P1S must just be the tax, but the quantity that's traded must be the amount that buyers want to buy at P1B, and it must be the amount, the quantity, that sellers want to sell at P1S. And my claim is that there is one and only one situation on our demand and supply diagram that will give us this outcome. It's where the quantity is Q1, the price buyers pay is P1B, which is exactly T dollars above the price sellers receive, P1S. To see that this is an equilibrium, notice that given the buyer price, P1B, buyers would like to buy Q1. Given the price of P1S, sellers would like to sell Q1. The amount buyers want to buy is just given by their demand curve. The amount sellers would like to sell is just given by the supply curve. Notice that the amount buyers want to buy and the amount sellers want to sell is the same thing so that their plans are able to be met and we've satisfied our price condition which is the buyer price is exactly T dollars above the seller price. So this is an equilibrium in the sense that Buyers and sellers are able to meet their plans, they're able to do what they want to do, but it's a tax equilibrium in our perfectly competitive model because the buyer price is not equal to the seller price, rather they're separated by the tax. The buyer price is T dollars above the seller price. Now, for our equilibrium to be a useful prediction, it's got to be something that we think will arise in the real world. So we have to ask, will the pizza market actually move to this outcome? To do that, we need to bring our dynamic assumptions in. Just a reminder, our dynamic assumptions say that if there's excess demand, the price will rise. If there's excess supply, the price will fall. Let's see why this will push us to the outcome on the previous slide. Here I've drawn a situation where the price that buyers pay is up here. The price that sellers receive is down here. Let me label that P1S. I've drawn that so the gap between them is exactly T dollars. So that satisfies our first condition that the price the buyer pays is the price the seller receives plus the tax. But notice that given the price P1B, Buyers would like to buy the quantity given by their demand curve. And let me just label that quantity down here by a yellow circle. The quantity that sellers would like to sell, well, that's given by the supply curve, given their price P1S. They would like to sell this quantity. Let me just label that by 
this quantity with a red circle. Notice that the quantity the buyers would like to buy is less than the quantity that sellers would like to sell. So in this situation, we have an excess of supply. Our dynamic assumption says when there's an excess of supply, the amount that sellers want to sell is more than they can actually sell. That's going to start pushing our prices down. It's going to push down both our buyer and our seller price. Why push down both of them? Well, remember, they've got to have a constant gap between them as given by the tax T. So this excess supply in this situation is going to start pushing our price down. Indeed, it's going to push the price down until the excess supply is eliminated. So the amount that buyers would like to buy will have increased. The amount sellers would like to sell will have decreased. They'll meet in the middle. What's that look like? Well, that's exactly the equilibrium we had on the previous slide. On this slide, I've got the reverse case. Our price to buyers up here, P1B. Our price to sellers down here, P1S. As before, they're drawn so that the gap between P1B and P1S is exactly T dollars. But notice as drawn here that the amount that buyers would like to buy, given the price P1B, given their demand curve, buyers would like to buy this amount over here, given by the red circle. Sellers, however, given the price P1S, they only want to sell a smaller amount. Let's put that on by an orange circle or a yellow circle. So the amount that buyers want to buy is more than the amount that sellers want to sell. So we have a situation of excess demand. If there's excess demand, that's going to start pushing up both the seller and the buyer price. Remember, the prices must stay separated by this constant amount T. So if one price goes up, the other price also has to go up. How far will they go up? Well, the buyer and seller prices will rise until the excess demand is eliminated. And that's exactly the situation we had on our equilibrium slide. So here is our tax equilibrium. We've got two features here. We have a separate buyer price and a seller price. The buyer price is exactly T dollars or the amount of the sales tax above the seller price. We have a quantity given by Q1. That's our equilibrium quantity traded. Given the price P1B, the price that buyers face, buyers would like to buy Q1. Given the price that sellers face, P1S, sellers would like to sell Q1. So both buyers and sellers are able to achieve their plans. And so we have an equilibrium. There is neither excess demand nor excess supply. A couple of things to note about this equilibrium before we finish. Firstly, what are the effects of a sales tax? Well, remember our initial equilibrium quantity was Q0. So by moving to a sales tax, we have a reduction in the quantity traded. Less pizza will be bought and sold if there's a sales tax on pizza. So a sales tax will tend to reduce the amount of trade that occurs. Second thing to note is that our sales tax has led to a change in prices. Our original price was given here by P0, but after the sales tax is introduced, we now have not one, but we have two prices. We have a price to buyers and a price to sellers. Notice that the price to buyers is above the original price, and the price to sellers is below the original price. So a sales tax will mean that buyers pay a higher price than without the sales tax, and a sales tax will mean that sellers get a lower price than without a sales tax. In other words, a sales tax pushes up the price to buyers and reduces the price that is received by sellers. Finally, notice that in our discussion of a sales tax, we didn't actually say who sent the money to the government. For example, under the Australian GST, or Goods and Services Tax, the tax revenue is collected by the retailers, or by the person selling the pizzas, and that person is required to send all the tax revenue to the government. That's the rule in most countries around the world when you're looking at sales taxes.
But notice that we didn't actually have to specify that when we looked at the changes due to the sales tax. We didn't have to say who sent the money to the government when working out the new quantity, the new buyer price, or the new seller price. And if you think about it for a second, that's pretty obvious. Just imagine that you go into the pizza shop and there's actually a person standing there. That person is from the government. They're the person who's going to collect the $2.50 sales tax when you buy a pizza. Now, it's pretty obvious that it doesn't matter who hands $2.50 to the person from the government. You could hand, say, $15 to the seller, the pizza seller, and $2.50 to the person from the government. That would be the case where the buyer pays the tax revenue to the government. You've paid $17.50 overall. The seller's received $15. The government's got $2.50. That's one alternative. Or you could hand $17.50 to the seller and they could immediately hand $2.50 to the person from the government. The seller would get to keep $15. You will have paid $17.50. The government gets $2.50. It actually doesn't matter whether you, as a buyer, pay the government or the seller pays the government. In fact, an efficient tax scheme works out who can send the money to the government most cheaply and they're the ones who we prefer to actually pay the government. For a sales tax, that's generally the retailer. Why is that important? Because you have no idea how much time is spent discussing this question. Who sends the money to the government? And basic economics says that, at best, that is a second-order question, it's a question dealing with how to make the tax system as efficient as possible. It doesn't actually affect any of our market predictions. We're going to look at that in more detail in our later presentations. So for now, that's all. Talk to you later.